16, the details of the program were announced to the world. Announced to the world. I ceased to be chairman in March 2016. So I cannot say so much about the details post March 2016. Post March 2016. I resigned as a chairman at the ending of March. I think it was March 24, 2016. St. Lucia was in the election mode, and the elections was June 6. There was not much time, Mr. Speaker, to be promoting the program globally. There was not much time, Mr. Speaker, to be out there receiving, you know, um, applications as such. The program was being set up six months, Mr. Speaker. A lot of procedures were being put into place, guidelines were being put into place in the early part of the program, Mr. Speaker. But in April, Henley castigated the program, especially cites lack of transparency in April. In May, Mr. Speaker, Henley issued a statement, Mr. Speaker, that the solution program was second to last in the world, and the last place program was Dominica, Mr. Speaker, in May 2016, before elections. A coordinated plan between Henley and partners and the United Workers Party, Mr. Speaker. And those of us that follow regional politics know the role of Henley and partners. And we followed the hearings in the House of Lords, House of Commons, about Cambridge Analytica. And in the presentation of this famous individual, he mentioned the role of Alexander Nix. He spoke of the role of Cambridge Analytica and what's the name of the other company um, they have in elections in St. Lucia and said that Henley and partners were financing elections in the Caribbean. The same Henley and partners that were financing elections in the Caribbean and was involved in the St. Lucia elections in 2011 Henley issues a statement in April saying attacking the St. Lucia CIP. And you talk about coordinated effort to undermine the CIP. In May, Henley ranks us second to last. Five months the program has started. And we second to last in the world. And Dom Lika is last. The same Henley that is financing elections in the Caribbean. And <laughs> They do finance UWP in Dominica and UWP in St. Lucia. And here it is, Mr. Speaker. And the Prime Minister said they were very supportive of the program. By February 2017, Henley and partners announced that they're opening in an office in St. Lucia. Is that coincidence, Mr. Speaker? The same company that was exposed in the House of Commons as financing elections in, in the Caribbean attacked the CIP in St. Lucia in April, attacked the CIP in May, less than a month before our elections, and we are told they are the ones financing the support parties that will give them exclusive rights to CIP. And in February, they announced the opening an office in St. Lucia. And guess who's the managing director? The Prime Minister's lawyer. The Prime Minister's lawyer. And we are told, Mr. Speaker, that they were supportive of the program and that we are the merchants of doom, Mr. Speaker. We are the merchants of doom, Mr. Speaker. I fail to understand, Mr. Speaker, how one can come and believe and accept that, Mr. Speaker, The Prime Minister continued, Mr. Speaker, and he said, and listen to it, Mr. Speaker, sometimes you listen to comments and you wonder, does that really make sense? But people say it because they believe some people will believe it. The Prime Minister, the CIP had a requirement to show your net worth is a minimum $3 million. And he said some people were having difficulty in showing their net worth or their, 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 their assets. If somebody is having difficulty in showing you their assets, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. That's a red flag, Mr. Speaker. So when the Prime Minister says they had to remove it, 
because people were having difficulty in showing it. That's why it is there. And Mr. Speaker, listen to what the IMF said, despite what the member from Ancillary Canary said. This about those who were nonsense and they were necessary and it was a wrong thing. Hear what the IMF said. These programs entail important reputational and financial integrity risks, which necessitate strict adherence to standards for due diligence, governance, and transparency. The cap on applicants and additional transparency regulations passed by the authorities may help contain these risks. Among these transparency provisions, the CIP unit would have to report annually to Parliament on the activities of the program, including on the number of applications, approvals, rejections, as well as detailed information on the successful applicants. But we are told having a cap is the worst thing we could do. We are told that. And a member from Ancillary is boasting that this was a waste of time. And a member from Castle South is, hey, what he says. Why would you want to have a cap of 500 when you can sell 1,000 after three years of running the program? Have they ever sold 500? Have they ever even reached the cap? And the IMF says the cap is a very important tool. And this is why when those provisions were removed, it raised questions about the integrity of the program. That's the simple point we are making that the changes they made affected the image and reputation of St. Lucia. The IMF said it. These are necessary. But we have been told in grand style, in pantomime, that those things are jokes and them guys don't know business. And we know business. I'm coming to that in a while, Mr. Speaker. Again, listen to the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, and I'm wondering whether it is not deliberate misinformation, just knowing if I say it, some people will believe it. The Goebbels theory of propaganda. Remember Goebbels, Mr. Mr. Speaker? Just, Goebbels was a very famous minister of propaganda in one of the most ill-fated regimes in the history of mankind. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister says marketing contracts were given. Marketing contracts were given. And those contracts have gone on and on and on for years, more than five years. years. Mr. Speaker, the CIP has not been in existence for five years. Where did the Prime Minister get that from? And he's saying that to this house, to inform the people of St. Lucia and members opposite are clapping. Yes, 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 yes. And the member from Ancillary is jumping out of his seat. But is that true, Mr. Speaker? Is that true? And he speaks about Aten. And why would a marketing agent be assisting the governor of St. Lucia to resolve the impact situation? Mr. Speaker, the, prime, the then Prime Minister said, he said openly, yeah. that they, one, of the, one of the, you know, you do SWOT analysis, one of the threats to our CIP program was the impact situation we had. And a marketing agent, who has ties with a very powerful lobbying company, offered to assist us to engage a lobbying company in Washington to speak to the U.S. authorities on our behalf. And that was done. And I want to ask the member from Miku South whether or not he has not met with Atten to continue the same work. Whether he has not, and if I have time, I will tell him exactly which hotel, which time it was done. Are you serious? But he can always stand up and say it's not true and I will withdraw it. Are you serious? But Mr. Speaker, he has met with Atten, Mr. Mr. Speaker. He has no, met with Arthur, no, no. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on the point of order, on the invitation. No, on the point of, of order, a point of. Oh, oh, what was the point Mr. of order? Speaker, he said a point of order, so let me. And an invitation, invitation of the minister, <laughs> of the member of, of parliament from, from Castro himself. We met in, 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 in Washington, uh, D.C., because the company was hired by them, which, of which the, the members on the opposite side had an opportunity to have said to the public the same thing they're saying now, if they were legit. Said in and I met with them, and we turned down and declined the offer and allowed the contract to, to, um, to, 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 to be discontinued. <laughs> Prime Minister, you're very mendacious in your statements. But, Mr. Speaker, let me, let me continue. Mr. Speaker. I like your word. <laughs> I raise the issue 
Mr. Speaker, about the, why do we need an escrow established outside St. Lucia? And the Prime Minister presented some guidelines, very well-written guidelines, for the establishment of an escrow outside St. Lucia. But does it deal with why is there a necessity to do so? The first line says, the developer must demonstrate the inability to open an escrow account within a bank in St. Lucia before they can be authorized. Why would a developer have an inability to open an escrow in St. Lucia? That's what we're asking. Why would there be an inability? And the Prime Minister had an opportunity to explain why there would be an inability. Why would a developer a multi-billion dollar, multi-millionaire developer having an inability to open an escrow in a bank in St. Lucia that he has to be given permission to open one outside. You understand, Mr. Speaker? That was a fundamental question. I wanted to know under what conditions, and I'm not saying it cannot happen, because if a bank is doing due diligence on a developer and find him very shady, they will not allow them to open an escrow account. The program is risky. There are monies received in St. Lucia for, for the program. There are, but banks are doing due diligence. And the banks will decide. The banks will decide whether or not a developer will be allowed and is trusted or they have confidence in that developer. And I wanted him to tell me, why would there be an inability, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, the, the minister from, the member from Miku South says... We have to change the CIP, because, real estate, because he wants to open up to schools and institutions of learning. Mr. Speaker, again, again, you wonder where the Prime Minister, the member from Miku South, the real estate is totally different, Mr. Speaker. There's something called enterprise under the CIP enterprise and under enterprise there are seven projects that can be approved specialty restaurants cruise ports and marinas agro processing plants pharmaceutical products ports bridges roads and highways research institutions and facilities and offshore universities the CIP Regulations already provide, already provide for that. So don't tell me you are changing the real estate option because you now want to open it up to institutions of learning. That's not real estate. And in any event, under enterprise, you can do that already. So what are you really talking about, honorable member? The member spoke about the SLP press release and said it's the highest demonstration of irresponsibility to have made such a press release disloyalty. and disloyalty. Honorable member will disagree. The Central Labour Party expressed its position on what was happening in the CIP. And I'm making it very clear, Mr. Speaker, that there was an instance, at least one that I will cite, where an individual failed due diligence, the regional intelligence agencies said to St. Lucia, do not approve that person. That person was rejected by the CIP, and that person was eventually granted citizenship. By who? Mr. Speaker. And the former CEO of the CIP was fired, Mr. Speaker. Minister, 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 Mr. Speaker, on a point of order. I can categorically state that no individual exists, categorically, and that no approvals have been given to people that have been rejected by JRCC. None. And I would like him to, I want to just make that point very elucidly clear. And if he has any evidence of, of that happening, and in terms of bringing up about the CEO being fired, CEO was not, was not qualified. CEO was not qualified. Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member, 
Honorable Member, the statement that you've made is a very, very strong one, a very powerful one. Um, Mr. Speaker, so I'm just going to say to you, yeah. be very careful Speaker, from now on. Mr. Speaker, a lot has been said person. today about me. I'm not standing to every. Can I add more? When the person was rejected, the person asked for a review. A committee was set up to review that person's application. And I will tell you, one of the persons who sat in on that review was the lawyer for that person. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr. Speaker, all of SA. And if the Prime Minister wants, we don't have to do it in public. He and I can meet privately. No, and I can, no, no, no. no? You want it public? Yeah, yeah. And I can give him the, the Prime Minister knows what I am talking about. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, I know exactly the individual that the person, the, the general, I do know. You know now. I know the individual. You know now. And that's why, I'm, why, that's why I'm cautioning you, okay, that the information that you have is absolutely incorrect. And that at no point, on the basis of the opinion of GRCC, that that opinion was a gone against. Okay? So I want you to know that there was a process that went through that includes where a person is entitled to be able to go and have an appeal. But the fact is, is that I can categorically say through you, Mr. Speaker, to the member of Cast Free South, that that same individual okay, had the approval of GRCC. And I know that for a fact, and I have that in writing. So please withdraw from making that statement. We would not approve anyone and have not approved anyone that has not been sanctioned and approved by JRCC. Can I continue, Mr. Speaker? My time is running now. Yes, yes, you may continue. So, um, you may continue, but you put the back and forth between on that particular point. It's going to tie the Parliament into a difficult position to determine who the Parliament should believe at this present time. You've made the point. If there is need for us to come back to this point sometime in the future, that's fine. But you've made your point, and the Prime Minister, though he's objecting to it, he's made his point. Move on from there. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. He says he remember the individual now. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, from the day that happened, Mr. Ooh, Speaker. Don't go back to the... No, I'm not going back. I'm going forward, Mr. Speaker. The whole confidence in due diligence in St. Lucia collapsed. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I will give some more examples. But the time is nigh, Mr. Speaker. The time is nigh, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, enough for the member for Miku South for now, Mr. Speaker. We will deal with this issue in greater detail at another date down the road, Mr. Speaker. The member from Ancillary Canary has raised some issues. And he shouted at me and he even said, Mr. Speaker, that I should be put in jail, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, you know, in due time, he says, I'll be put in jail. Now, Mr. Speaker, a lot has we've happened. Gone, we've gone past that Mr. statement. Speaker, huh? Mr. No, Speaker, I'm not telling you. I'm just saying we've gone past that statement, so let's not Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, for the entire day, other members have spoken. Nobody has interrupted them. But, Mr. Speaker, you know, allow me to, allow me to make my I'm contribution. I'm not denying you your, your right to speak. I'm just saying to you, we, you're raising something that has been dealt with. I have ruled on that. Statement well, he says, was he says just a matter of Let's time before on. I'm put in jail. Just a matter of time. But, Mr. Speaker, I don't have to chronicle to this parliament the persecution that I undergo from people trying to break in my house repeatedly to the threats. I don't have to do it. So if it is jail I'm going to go to, let it happen, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, yeah, yes, repeated. That, that's Mr. Member for Miku South. Let, let me, Mr. Speaker, so I, he shouted at me about the projects, whether they were high end. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you. I can tell you, and I will show, share with you the little evidence that I have in my possession, Mr. Speaker, that the projects which were approved during the time of the San Lucia Labour Party all met the requirements. The Prime Minister shouted, Boca, did they have any approval? I can tell you from the documents, I, I just happened to carry an envelope with me with some documents. I actually have one of the requirements for approval 
is that you have to submit to the CIP and the investment Lucia a copy of your approval in principle to start the project. And I have with me a copy of a letter dated July 27, 2006. The Labour Party was not in power yet. What? You know. Re Asmahu Estate Touristic. Hold on. Asmahu Estate Belvide Soufre, DC, ARN 745 2006. Now imagine that. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, the member is misleading the House. He said the Labour Party was not in office July 27, 2006. Election was in December of 2006. All right, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. The, the member, Honourable Members, Mr. Let's just Mr. Get... Speaker, yes, yes. The member Speaker. cannot come to this Honourable House. Mr. Speaker, I said it was the UWP that was Honourable Member Catherine South. In July, in July of 2000, he, we, the be, UWP came into office on December 11, 2006. Very well. He will. If that is the case, then he will. Continue, member. So, Mr. Speaker, one of the documents that had to be submitted was a copy of the approval in principle. I was told earlier today by the member that Boca had no approval. Had no approval. And Boca had approval in principle, Mr. Speaker. From the DCA. And Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Mr. Speaker, Speaker I stand on the point of order. I think it is important that they. The I document which to, the member is referencing Honorable. will be the document of the House. Because what I Honorable. suspect he's referencing... Honorable, you have to... T wait. Yes. Mr. Speaker, you, can can't, you cannot just see a point of one and just start speaking. You realize. The second document, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I, he's still standing on the point of order. Yeah. Now on. Mr. What's Speaker, the point can of order? this document which he's sharing, so that we can verify its authenticity, that it be made a document of the House? Because I suspect, Mr. Speaker, what he has in his hand is a document to... to change the land use from agriculture to tourism. And I want to verify that it is, in fact, a principle, an agreement, in, uh, a, a, uh, an approval in principle by the DCA, which he has as it pertains to a planned development and not... My, my point of order is make it a document of the House. We want to see it. Please make it a document of the House. Can I continue? Continue. You will identify the document you refer to. Mr. Speaker... I, I don't think the member wants me to quote Erskine Mays and who is responsible for making documents of the House. Mr. Speaker, the second point that was made was that it was not high-end. And I have a copy of the Cabinet conclusion, Mr. Speaker, where it was actually said, Mr. Speaker, that it was a... Pr All I want you to do is to just identify the document. I said, you Mr. Can, Speaker, it's a letter. Don't just say you have a Cabinet conclusion. Mr. Speaker, is a, DC, yeah. a letter yes. from the DCA dated July 27, 2006. You understand? July 27, 2006. And it provides approval in principle, has been granted for touristic lands and de design concept to your project proposal to develop the Asmahu Estate as a touristic resort. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the man is misleading, the honorable member is missing in the house on a point of order. Let, let the man complete and let him, I'm, I'm just following your statement. You see, I've already said the same thing you just said. Allow the honorable member to identify the document. He was doing that. And thereafter, we will come Mr. back. Speaker, I will repeat to. the point. The member said that the projects which were approved by the Labour Party did not meet the requirements of the CIP. And I said, Mr. Speaker, that there were two principal requirements based on what he said. They had to have approval in principle, and secondly, they had to be a high end, because he was saying they were not high end. The member for Miku shouts, shouted, Boca. I showed that I actually have documents that there was approval in principle, and secondly, Boca had indicated that it would be a, a, a resort um, under the enchantment group of hotels, which is high end. The other hotel was the Shabusha Hotel, and we all agree, and it's a project that was, and by the way, Mr. Speaker, do you know the first project that was visited? The first project that was visited by the member from ancillary countries after the elections? And I have a clip of it somewhere. Mr. Speaker, I rise on the point of order. I really have to. Mr. Speaker, um, the document... What is the point of order? Which the... He's Honorable the, member. The, Mr. Speaker, the member for Castries South 
continues to mislead the House in his entire presentation. The document which he's referenced is a clear indication that he's referring to a change in land, use of the lands from agriculture to tourism lands and not, Mr. Speaker, an approval in principle on a resort development, which is a different matter altogether. Okay. And so, Mr. Speaker, in order for you to get from DCA a, an approval in principle on a tourism development, you would have had to submit some drawings. You would have had to submit, Mr. Speaker, a master plan. Okay? But what he's referring to and what he's quoting, and hence the reluctance to share the document with the rest of the House, he's quoting, Mr. Speaker, a document from the DCA, which clearly says that they approve the lands to change from agriculture to touristic, which is totally misleading this House. And so, Mr. Speaker, I appeal with you again, let the, for a matter of verification, please make the document a document of the House. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, there's no standing order for that, Mr. Speaker. But I don't no, mind, Mr. Not. Speaker, you reading the documents and you ascertaining as the presiding officer whether this letter does not speak of drawings. It does not say to the, de the, the designer, you can come and collect the stamp drawings, and it says anything resembling what he says. This is gross disrespect of the house. I don't mind you reading it, Mr. Speaker, and return it. I'm under no obligation to make it a document house. But, Mr. Speaker, I'm quite willing to share it with you, Mr. Speaker. But it is, as you can imagine, Mr. Speaker, the nature of the document. But the, the member is very forthright in his accusations, Mr. Speaker. I cannot make statements. I cannot get away with it. But it's done with want and abandon, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the second point... Let me, just, let me just inform for clarity. Let me just inform the House that the document is not one to shift the land use purpose, but for one for touristic development. So, Mr. Speaker, it just shows you the mockery that is made of this Honorable House, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the other point that was made about the Boca Estate, the other development was the Shabusha Hotel. As far as I know, it was a high-end resort. Range was building a Mr. Ritz Speaker, Carter. on a point of order... Yes, On point of order. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member for Castries South is telling this Honorable House that a submission made to the DCA for an approval in principle in 2006 and when CIP was introduced in 2015 the legislation and in 2016, the project was launched. That 10 years later, that CIP board can sit down and approve a project that was approved 10 years before we had even started dreaming about CIP. And, and, and you mean after the 10 years, it was still approval in principle? No drawings after 10 years? Nothing. And all of a sudden, Mr. Speaker, it emerges and it becomes a CIP-approved project on the basis of an approval in principle 10 years before. And I'm supposed to accept that as being transparent in this Honorable House. Mr. Honorable. Speaker, the information is very questionable Honorable by member. the member for Castries South. <laughs> Honorable member, 
I accept your submission, but the question is, um, I'm not here to rule on, on, on policy of succeeding governments. That is not my role. Um, all the member did say was that at the time, he said, the development had a, an approval in principle, and he said that one of the guiding principles for CIP at the time. And so he's, he, he made reference to the letter to indicate that at the, at the time, they had CIP, they had um, approval in principle. I'm not here to rule on whether it was right or wrong, but I'm just saying. Can I, can I continue, yeah. Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, why doesn't that happen to all the other speakers in the House? Why am I the only one that must be subjected to those frivolous, you know, interruptions, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, can I, can I move on to the Prime Minister? Honorable, honorable Member, I say keep your objectives to yourself. Keep my objectives. I'll, I'll remember that. Keep reminding me, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure I shall falter from time to time. Mr. Speaker, the member from Miku South came into this House earlier today and circulated some documents, tables, comparisons of CIP. Mr. Speaker, he never said where he got it from, the source of the document, the authenticity of the document. The same member who's asked for documents before they be made documents of the House, that the authenticity be established, Mr. Speaker. But let me just raise a couple questions about it, Mr. Speaker. Can I just beg that you refer to the document, Mr. Speaker? There is one that says comparison table of all CBI programs. An application profile, single applicant. Single applicant, right? Documents, let's go by. Is it colored one? It's a the... colored one, not a colored one. We okay. won't have time to go for the colored one. All right. I just want to make a simple point on it. Why you cannot trust much of what comes from the other side. So, Mr. Speaker, it says St. Lucia, single applicant. Total investment costs non-refundable. Real estate, a hundred and is at eighteen thousand one hundred and thirty. One hundred and eighteen. You go to our regulations. Non-refundable processing fee, two thousand US. Applicant non-refundable administration fee, fifty thousand US. Due diligence and background check fees, 7,500 US. If you add it, it comes up 59,500 US. How did this 118, how, how, where did that come from? As a non-refundable, and then it goes on, Mr. Speaker, that the real estate investment for St. Lucia is 330,000 US. I go back to our regulations, Mr. Speaker. I go back to our regulations. Applicant, single, 300,000 US. But who is advertising these figures, Mr. Speaker? Who? And who is bringing it into this house as an authentic reflection of the cost? Maybe I'm missing something, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, let's put that on a side no, for now. Because, the house? But it, well, I guess the, <laughs> the point has been made, Mr. Speaker, that the member from Microsoft presented that to us as the authority and the reason why the fees are to be changed. <laughs> but all the figures in there are different. Maybe there is a valid explanation. I'm always prepared to give the honorable member you know, the benefit of my generosity, although I don't enjoy it in this house. But But Mr. Speaker, <laughs> nowhere in this document you see any indication where it came from, its origins, its authenticity, and it's presented to this house, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, let's move on, because I have to respond to the member from Castries Southeast. I never remember Castries South. Your colleagues are preventing me from hearing you. Everyone on the other side is silent now. Silent. Continue, sir. I am very... Can I tell you, Mr. Speaker, I don't feel happy when the other side is silent. I don't feel happy. I like when the other side... So, Mr. Speaker, let me move on to the member from Castro Southeast. Honorable members. Mr. Speaker, the member from Castro Southeast. I'm, I'm just trying to get the, the, the house back to 
some quietness. The fright of silence. silence. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, okay. the member from Castle South he said a lot of things, and you told me don't use certain adjectives and keep them to myself. But yeah, for now, for now, Mr. Speaker, for now, for, for now, Mr. Speaker. I don't want the time to run out on me, and I need to address some of the critical points raised by the member from Castle South East. And he, his presentation, Mr. Speaker, I must say it was unbecoming, as far as I am concerned, in this House, Mr. Speaker. It, it was really unbecoming, Mr. Speaker. But I will answer him on some of his points, Mr. Speaker. He first made reference, Mr. Speaker, to the Dominica Housing Program. And he was pontificating, and he was lecturing about how you know, Dominica, if they did not make the change that St. Lucia is making, would not be able to have housing. And he's so wrong, Mr. Speaker. He's just saying anything, anyhow, Mr. Speaker. The Dominica housing program is not funded under a real estate option, Mr. Speaker. It is not. And I'll give the Prime Minister credit for one thing, Mr. Speaker. You know, when the Prime Minister had announced that he was setting up a sovereign fund, I actually support a sovereign fund, and I thought if he could find a way to link CIP to a sovereign fund, that would be a brilliant move. Granted, what he did after was a total disaster. It resulted in we having to pay range millions of dollars. But Mr. Speaker, whoever had suggested this to him actually gave him a very good idea. Mr. Speaker, Dom Laker, right now, today, at this present moment, was handing over almost 60-something houses to people in Dominica, and it was not under the real estate option. You can build houses for the people of St. Lucia under the National Economic Fund. You can. You can do it. Well, if you can design a way, and I know you're very creative in your, in your accumulation of wealth, you will be able to do it. But it's, I am telling you, Dominica, that you cited as an example, you were wrong. And you were very wrong. And you were misleading this house and misleading the people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order. On a point of order. The Honorable member, members. The member for Castry South cannot say or cannot prove that I was misleading the house by citing what Dominica is doing today. For the simplest reason, Mr. Speaker. A government can launch a, pro, a project, and if you get an investor who's willing to come in and sell CIP to build houses through a real estate project that you can donate to the people of St. Lucia is not far-fetched or out of the league. And the point I was making, Mr. Speaker, is that in expanding the rich of that program by widening the areas in which you can do the real estate project. It can give you the opportunity to be able to do housing as Dominica is doing housing and giving to its people. Not, that, not the source of funding I was recommending for what Dominica did. So Mr. Speaker, in him trying to interpret what I said, he is completely misleading the House because we have had discussions about the possibility of engaging in a program of housing construction to the poor and the needy in this country and to do it through a real estate project. So the member cannot say that what I said is misleading the House. He may be on a different tangent, but not... not to say that what I'm saying was misleading. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm glad, I'm, different on different tangents, tangents. Right? I'm glad I'm on a different tangent. Parallel tangent. lines. Parallel lines, Mr. Speaker. Because the member from Castle's office made a statement, which was a powerful statement. He said a leopard cannot change its spots. Oh, that's Sigmund, that's he said it about you, but I think he was also in a Freudian kind of way, Sigmund Freudian kind of way speaking about his own self, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, he said in his presentation, he expanded the boundaries of the debate, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, well, Mr. Speaker, this is the same member, Mr. Speaker, who's 
brother was on television, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Mr. Member. Speaker, you saying honorable when it was been said about me, no, Mr. No, no, Speaker. No, 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 no. That's you not wanted what, me to no, stomach Listen it. to me. Listen to me. But you don't want are you me. Going to, are you going to divert every time a member makes a statement? No, Mr. Man. Speaker. The honorable member said a lot of things. He said we did not understand how to use money. He said we did not understand, and he said so, you know, about basic common sense in business. This member from Castor's office has a lot of sense in business. CNTS, Mr. Speaker, a lot of sense in business. This is the same honorable member, Mr. Speaker, who signed how many direct purchase, how many direct purchase in one day. That's his basic common sense in business. He, Mr. Speaker, stood in a press conference awarding a check, Mr. Speaker, for CHTTI. And when he was challenged, he said he can build as many schools as he wants for his wife. That's his basic common sense in business. And he says, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Oh, you, on you a point of order. Now. On a point of order, Mr. Speaker. I was issuing, I want the member to bring the evidence that that I was issuing a check. Mr. Speaker, I've never issued any check. And the member has to withdraw that statement. If he can bring anything to show where I was handing a check to my wife. No, Mr. Speaker, if he cannot provide it, he has to withdraw that statement. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, continue, sir, and yeah. trying to stay. No, you don't divert every stay. time a member Mr. Speaker, stands and makes a. This is the same honourable member that a letter was circulating authorizing Pajua to raise millions of dollars. That's the common sense in business. The honourable member is speaking about. That's the common sense, Mr. Speaker, and he challenges us on this side, and I'm proud that my colleagues are not involved in that kind of common sense in business. I'm proud of it. But you are, up today, we are waiting for the report on the investigation, Mr. Speaker. The same member who stood on a platform and he says, he doesn't send people to commit his crimes for him, he does it himself. And he tells us we don't have common sense in business. And he wants to accuse me, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. You just said asking Mr. Point Speaker. Of order. On a point of order again, Mr. Speaker. The member is saying, making a lot of false statements. This member never said that he's committing crime himself. I said if. And, and, that, is, and that is the operative word, if. So if the member is going to quote me, Mr. Speaker, correct. he has to quote correctly or he has to withdraw that statement. I agree. What exactly you said? What did you say? What did you say? What did you say? Honorable Member. Quote. Mr. Speaker, I didn't quote him correctly. If you quote him, quote correctly. Mr. The member Speaker. has never said that he's committing crimes. Okay, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. And if I quoted him wrong, let him stand again. The Honorable Mr. Member... Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, I want the statement withdrawn. Okay, what exactly do you want withdrawn? And I'll withdraw it. And I'll withdraw it. What do you want withdrawn? I'll withdraw it. I'll withdraw whatever he wants me to withdraw. So the I statement you okay. made with reference to that the member said on a platform that he's committing crimes himself. No, I said, he said he would not want, um, he will not send people to commit crimes. If you have to commit a crime, he'll do it himself. And he, and he just said, that's exactly what he said. So, so, so what do you want me to withdraw? Is he on point? Mr. Speaker, his first statement was what? that I committed yeah. crime. That was yeah. his first statement, and that is the statement that he did to withdraw. Okay, I withdraw. Mr. Speaker, is the same member from Castle Southeast that said on a television program, and if my memory fails me, he can correct me, at the CDP to the Taiwanese, he had to pretend that projects were completed in order to get money, Mr. Speaker. That's his common sense in business. We don't understand the CIP. We don't have common sense in business, Mr. Speaker. But he does. And I can withdraw it if you want me to withdraw no, it. No, no. <laughs>
I'm just trying to get your members. Uh, oh, don't worry about my members. We, they, they're all right, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I must tell you, the honorable member spoke about the National Atomic Fund. Mr. Speaker, in June this year, we had a debate in this House about the National Economic Fund. And I stated then, and I still believe, it's one of the worst pieces of legislation ever to come to this House. It institutionalizes malpractice, at least the potential for malpractice. And since he presented it, let me just refer to it briefly, Mr. Speaker. The National Economic Fund bill that he speaks so, or is it now legislation that he spoke so highly about, this is the most irregular, irregular piece of legislation. Hear what it says, Mr. Speaker. The functions of the fund are to advance loans for government-approved capital project. To advance loans for government-approved capital project. So here it is, Mr. Speaker. A contractor wants to build a road, which is a government-approved capital project. So he goes to the Minister of Infrastructure and he gets a contract to build it, build finance, whatnot. But he doesn't have money. But that Ministry of Finance must pay him monthly or quarterly payments for the road he's built. But guess where he's getting the money? He goes to our CIP money. To take the money, to then build a road for government and to charge government. You think he will ever charge government less than what he has to pay the CIP economic fund? He won't. Otherwise, he'd be making a loss. He would be making a loss. If he's taking a loan, Mr. Speaker, to build a road, he must make a profit, of course. And he'll make a profit by charging government an appropriate fee for him to make a profit. So we are taking our CIP money. Rather than build a road ourselves, we're going to give it a loan to Fresh Start or whichever one to build a road and then, then to charge government for building the road. This is the National Economic Fund. This advanced loans, Mr. Speaker. Here another provision of it. To purchase government bonds. To purchase government bonds. And you know what it reminded me of? There's a technique that's used in the music industry. You release an album, the recording company goes out, they buy all the records, and they say one million copies have been sold. Platinum. Hit. And everybody rushes to buy it. So... You're going to use CIP money to buy government bonds that government now has to repay how? I mean, why would government use the money to go and buy bonds to implement projects? And the more, Mr. Speaker... Speaker, Mr. Speaker on a point of order. What point of order, Mr. Speaker? Point of order, please, Mr. Speaker, the, the member from the opposite side just said that in fact he applauded me for considering that we're going to have a sovereign fund. The economic fund is acting sovereign like fund. a sovereign fund. That once acting the money like. goes into the economic fund, Mr. Speaker, and it clearly states so in the legislation, that all it can do is to lend the money out. And the point is that when it lends the money out, the value of the asset remains with government. So if government chooses, instead of reducing debt and paying down on the debt, it wants to convert longer term uh, bonds that are at a higher price, both the state is going to benefit, but also the value of the economic fund remains intact. So if the member is going to see on one hand that he applauds us for looking at a sovereign fund, and the economic fund is set up exactly like a sovereign fund, then you can't come out and start criticizing it from that perspective. So please, read the, in, pre, please read the act in its entirety and understand that it's acting like a sovereign fund. It is lending the money to do capital projects. If lending is the, is the active word here. And therefore, the money has to be repaid back to the sovereign fund. So the asset value of the sovereign fund remains intact at all times, Speaker, exactly like a sovereign fund. Order, sovereign funds in Norway do the same thing. They lend money to other entities in order to keep the value of the sovereign fund. Can I continue? You know, Mr. Speaker, he says it acts like a sovereign fund. It sovereign if it quacks like a duck, a duck, if it walks like a duck, if it smells like a duck, then it's a duck. A rooster cannot act like a duck. A sovereign fund is a sovereign fund. Yeah, but roosters can lay eggs, though. Roosters can lay eggs. <laughs> 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 Mr. Speaker, roosters lay eggs. this is a national economic fund. This roosters is not the sovereign eggs. fund. And Mr. Speaker, li li listen to this, Mr. Speaker. 
he, he, he what is, and the member from Kasi South he said this was a brilliant creation of his government. Hey, what frightens me about, about this, Mr. Speaker? Listen to this, Mr. Speaker. In deciding the grant or refusal of an application, the board shall, after consultation with cabinet, take into consideration the credentials of the person and information relating to the government capital project. Since when? You have to give somebody a loan. You have to go and consult cabinet. When you go for a loan in any bank, the bank doesn't go and consult cabinet. If this is a fund open, transparent for people to seek funding, do you have to go to cabinet to uh, get approval to give somebody a loan from the National Economic Fund? We all know who are the people that will get all the loans, Mr. Speaker. We should not be frightened to see what it is, Mr. Speaker. And I don't have time, Mr. Speaker, to go through all the provisions of this National Economic Fund. But I can tell you, the Senator Labour Party will immediately, you know, amend this thing. This cannot stay on the books in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know, Mr. Speaker, I heard the member from Castle South East taunting the people of St. Lucia and members opposite and asking, you hope we all come to the race on December the 14th, the DSH, the Peter Cup, I forget it's called. And Mr. Speaker, I must tell you, well, I, I don't know if they ban justify. You, Mr. Speaker, it is painful, Mr. Speaker, that the member from Castle South East will be taunting us about the DSH race coming up in December. Mr. Speaker, at a time when in this country, honorable leaders, at a time when, Mr. Speaker, our CIP money can be used, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we transition to OKEU and solutions are granted a better um, service in healthcare. Mr. Speaker, every single member in this house, and I'm sure almost every single person listening to me, can speak of the horrors that solutions are going through healthcare in this country. The member from Castle South East stood up month after month, press conference after press conference, saying all the things they will do and when it will start, and this and that, and national health insurance, Mr. Speaker. And we now, Mr. Speaker, more, almost three and a half years into this government, and our people are literally dying at our medical institutions, Mr. Speaker. They are dying. And Mr. Speaker, if I had time, I would recount experiences of my constituents, Mr. Speaker. We have seen photos coming out of VH, Mr. Speaker. The conditions that people have to go through, Mr. Speaker. And what the member finds amusing is to boast about the DSH race, Mr. Speaker. I saw the member from Miku South post pictures of the stables and how beautiful and advanced and spacious they are. And I wondered, Mr. Speaker, a short distance away at the, at the George Audler National Stadium, Mr. Speaker, that the horses are enjoying better conditions at DSH, Mr. Speaker, than St. Lucians are enjoying at St. Jude Hospital at the stadium, Mr. Speaker. And you want me to come to a DSH race in December, Mr. Speaker? That's what you want me to do? Mr. Speaker, you know, Mr. Speaker, I think Mr. Speaker is an insult to the people of St. Lucia. And we had to use St. Lucia taxpayers' money to build the road, Mr. Speaker, to facilitate the restrict, Mr. Speaker. And we know what we were told in this house, and all the members opposite clap. It was a road that has been built because of the new airport that will be built, and it requires this, and it's vision we have. This is the same government, Mr. Speaker, that boasted, Mr. Speaker, that they were the executors. They are literally the executors, Mr. Speaker. They said they would be implementing projects. We were promised 10 hotels in the first year. How many in the second year? Five in the second year. We were promised so many things, Mr. Speaker. More than three years, St. Lucians are waiting, Mr. Speaker. Our CIP is in crisis, and persons are laughing about the upcoming DSH race, Mr. Speaker. We were told, Mr. Speaker, we were told about school repair. And I must say to you, when I heard $10 million will be spent every year and Labour Party barely spent $2 million, I was like, wow, this is serious business. But I did not know 
that 2 million under Philip JPA goes a lot further than 10 million under this present government. That 2 million, that 32 million goes a lot further than that 10 million. Because every year, how many schools, Mr. Speaker, never before have we had so many schools not op able to open before, open at the date of school opening. And you know what? We've had two sittings, Mr. Speaker. And the member from Miku North has not found it fitting to come to this honorable house and make a statement about the opening of school and the conditions of schools in this country. I can tell you one thing, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I am sure if the managers were in the Department of Infrastructure, I probably would have had a lot more confidence in what has been done with it, Mr. Speaker. And I, no, I, I'm being genuine, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm not just, you know, making the honorable member feel, you know, good about himself. But I know it would have been that it better. I heard about the Sports Academy. A national disgrace, Mr. Speaker. And the honorable member from Cassius office wants to laugh and smile and talk about business sense. Mr. Speaker, after school opened, they started to put tractors at the sports academy to start preparing the facility. Where are the children now? They moved them from the school to the pastoral center, and I think they're back at their homes now. And you talk about you are the executors, paying Pimando over $15 million to suppose to give you the vision of where St. Lucia has to go, and will reorganize planning and implementation in St. Lucia. Are we seeing St. Lucia, are St. Lucia seeing the benefit of that money, Mr. Speaker? And the honorable member from Cassius office wants to laugh and taunt us how we are failures and they are the success stories. Are St. Lucians feeling a success story, Mr. Speaker? Are they? Monies have been taken off, Mr. Speaker, to build roads, tax, gas tax to build roads. And I'm begging, and the honorable member every now and then sends a potholing crew, you know, Mr. Speaker. Where are the roads that have been built, Mr. Speaker? Where, where are the roads that have been built with our tax, gas tax money, Mr. Speaker? Tell me. And the member from Cassie South East wants to smile and laugh and accuse people, Mr. Speaker. Soulless, Mr. Speaker. Soulless, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I heard a clip in from London. The Prime Minister said crime is on the decline in St. Lucia, and we have CCTVs cameras operating from Castries all the way to the north, tracking criminals. I'm sure I heard that. I, I heard it, Mr. Speaker, in the background playing. Somebody was playing it, and I'm listening. And I'm saying, is that the St. Lucia that I live in now? That crime is on the decline. The, the member from Microsoft promised us that Kenny couldn't do it, and he would do it. He would do it. He would solve impacts. He would solve crime in St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, are we enjoying this? So when we stand in this house and we say to them, we do not trust the changes that you are making because those changes are going to further affect the image and reputation of St. Lucia. We know what we're talking about, Mr. Speaker. Yes. We know what we're talking about. And the honorable member from Cassius South East will want to accuse me. I'm not saying much on that. I will get my idea of glory. And when I have my idea of glory, the whole of Cassius South will party, Mr. Mr. Speaker. But this honorable member a talk show host repeatedly says live on the air that you tried that the member tried to bribe him and nothing has been done about that if somebody says you try to bribe me for a million dollars and it's not true i will sue them and that was your colleague and you want to stand and accuse me mr speaker and tell me about you cannot trust my judgment on cip mr speaker whilst there is a present investigation in miami the ascenza investigation that involves the member from Cassius office mr speaker and he wants to stand here and cast oppositions, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, cast on a point of order, I want the member to show which investigation that is going on in Miami that includes me. If the member cannot show that there's an investigation going on, then he needs to withdraw that statement. Honorable Member Castrisson. Mr. Speaker, because this is casting, casting Mr. Speaker, speaker. we have tried to make the document a document of the House before. It has been stopped, Mr. Speaker. And if you want, Mr. Speaker, at the next sitting of the House, I will table the documents that led me to say what I said. I can promise you that. I will so come until to the next such of the time. House. Until such time, I will not repeat it. But, Mr. Speaker, but Mr. Speaker, if you want me to withdraw yes. it, I withdraw it, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker. When the Honorable yes. me Member comes, until, and, the next until the next meeting, 
And Mr. Speaker, I promise you I'll make that document at the House. And Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member of Cassius Office comes and smiles and shows his, all his teeth, Mr. Speaker, as if it's a joke, Mr. Speaker. This is about serious business, Mr. Speaker. Serious business. When we, Mr. Speaker, when we, Mr. Speaker, stand in this Honorable House and we raise question of the members opposite, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member, you don't need protection at all? <laughs> I've been battered and bruised all day, Mr. Speaker. I, I can take it. Mr. Speaker, you see, when we stand in this Honorable House and we, Mr. Speaker, raise those issues, we do so because we believe we are the custodians and the protectors and the guardians of good governance and accountability and transparency. I was generous enough to say, whereas I want the regulations to be reinstated, I leave it to the government to decide the policy as to what fees that they want, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, if after all the jobs I've had in my life I cannot buy a vehicle, then it was totally useless. But Mr. Speaker, the, the, Mr. Speaker, can I continue, Mr. Speaker? Continue. So, Mr. Speaker, I will not be distracted. We stood in this house because we are the guardians of this democracy. We are the ones that are supposed to hold the government to account. And we have every reason to believe that the image, the reputation of St. Lucia's religious CIP has been undermined and damaged. And Mr. Speaker, I stand by our motion that the regulations should be reinstated. Thank you very much. No, no. You will deal with it. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament, by negative resolution, approved that Regulation 2 and Regulation 10 provided by statutory instrument number statutory instrument 2015 number 89 be hereby reinstated i now put a question as many as are of that opinion say i as many as of a contrary opinion say no no i think the nose have it the nose have it Bills, Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs and the Public Service. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the first reading of a bill shortly entitled Companies Amendment. Companies Amendment. Honorable Prime Minister. Speaker, I beg to move for the suspension of standing order number 482 to allow the bill to go through its remaining stages at this sitting. Honorable Members, the question is that standing order number 482 be suspended in order to allow the Honorable Minister to proceed with the remaining stages of the bill at this sitting. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leave is granted. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move for a second reading of a bill shortly entitled Companies Amendment. Um, in December 2018, the Companies Act Cap 1301, the Act was amended in order to comply with transparency requirements specified by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, to ensure that the companies provide beneficial ownership information. However, after these changes were made, it was observed that companies should also be required to disclose beneficial ownership information at any point when those persons are, are, are changed. Therefore, a company must not only disclose its beneficial owners at the point of incorporation, 
or registration, but also when there is a change that beneficial to that beneficial owner. Furthermore, a company that fails to adhere to this provision is liable to pay a fee to the registrar of companies for failure to comply. It was also observed that the Act required a minor amendment by way of a deletion of a duplicated provision regarding the requirement for a company to send a notice of beneficial owners to the registrar at the time of sending articles of incorporation. And since this requirement is already captured under the Money Laundering Prevention Act 12.20, a company that is registered or licensed under the Financial Services Regulatory Authority Act Cap 12.23 is required to provide beneficial ownership information to the registered agent or trustee and to those and those persons are captured under the Money Laundering Prevention Act Cap 12.20. Additionally, the Act is amended to make uh, other changes with respect to the incorporation of a company by requiring information that a director is a fit and proper person. Currently, the requirement for companies to file an allotment of shares and notice of secretary are inadequate. Therefore, a time period by which these documents need to be filed after incorporation is introduced for certainty. Where a company fails to submit this information to the Registrar of Companies and Intellectual Property, that company is liable to pay a fee for failure to adhere to this requirement. This approach is easier and practical instead of institutional legal proceedings against every company that fails to comply with this requirement. It is also necessary to amend the Act to improve the processes and procedures by which the Registrar of Companies and Intellectual Property can notify a company of its obligations to file annual returns. By addressing these matters in the bill, it is expected that the rate of compliance by companies with the requirements under the Act will increase and that the procedures and the work at the Registry of Companies and Intellectual Property will improve significantly. Honorable members, the question is that the company's amendment bill be read a second time. Member for Vifort South. Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll be brief. I want to show you because I know they. Mr. Speaker, there are some provisions in this bill that are welcome provisions. And uh, as someone now who's engaged in, in practice, one has a better sense of how these provisions actually work. So, for example, I don't think one can object to the new clauses that require a secretary of a company to be appointed within a specified period. And I think it is a matter that really does deserve um, correction because it is well known that many companies are registered and it takes ages before um, a secretary um, is appointed or assistant secretary for that, for that matter. So I, I don't want to, under any circumstances, suggest that some of these provisions are not required. I think some of them are helpful, but there are some issues. I'm glad that the Attorney General is here and listening to at least this, this part of the debate. First, I, I would like to find out whether these provisions have been discussed with the Bar Association. And the reason why I ask is that I suspect the implementation of some of these provisions would be challenging. I think one of the first things to bear in mind is that there would be a major slowdown in the incorporation of companies in Situsha. And uh, the implications for our rankings in respect of doing business will obviously be, be a very a real one. Um, because if you really look at it, uh, Mr. Speaker, if you look at Clause 3, um, the new requirements under 3B, by inserting after subsection 2 the following new subsections 2A to B, in determining whether a person is a fit and proper person, to hold a position as director of a company, the following must be considered. Now, go through, the, go through the list of these requirements. The person's probity, competence, and soundness of judgment 
for fulfilling the responsibilities of a director. How do you judge that? What is the evidence do you procure to judge that? The academic or professional qualifications or effective experience in business administration or other relevant disciplines. What if the incorporator or the director happens to be a small business person who may not necessarily have these qualifications? What is the weight that you attach to this? Then the diligence with which the person is fulfilling or is likely to fulfill the responsibility. How do you judge that? Who judges that? Is it that the attorney who is incorporating the company um, provides an affidavit to the effect that in his or her judgment that the person satisfies the criteria here? And then you go on, Mr. Speaker, if you look at 2B, very quickly again, without limiting the generality of subsection 2A, the consideration must be given to the previous conduct and activities in business or financial matters of the person in question, and in particular to evidence that the person has committed an, committed an offense involving fraud or other dishonesty or violence. Again, uh, Mr. Speaker, I assume, so maybe it will require a police record to, to, to evidence that. Um, contravene a provision made by or under an enactment designed for protecting members of the public against financial laws due to dishonesty, incompetence, or malpractice. How do you judge those things? How do you judge the incompetence? Is there a judgment on the person in the firm or the business to that effect? And then look at C. Engage in a business practice appearing to the board to be deceitful, oppressive, or otherwise improper, whether unlawful or not, or which otherwise reflect discredit on that person's method of conducting business. Different people conduct businesses in different ways. They have different approaches, different style. How the member for Castro Southeast will conduct the business of his company would be very different, let us say, from how the member for Castro South will conduct his business, as, as we heard, Mr. Speaker, from the earlier testimony during the previous debate. These are very real issues, Mr. Speaker. And if you look at item D, to be D, an employment record that suggests that the person carried out an act of impropriety in the handling of his employer's business. Now, how again do you evidence that when it is known that in many companies in St. Lucia, members of staff commit acts of impropriety and the businesses themselves hide the information and in fact settle it quite often, settle it privately so that it is not part of any record. So, Mr. Speaker, if I'm not in the business of recommending changes to legislation anymore, I'm done with that. All I'm saying is that I believe that there are some very serious practical issues to operationalize these provisions necessary as they are. Now, Mr. Speaker, let me just very, very quickly turn to one other matter. Some time ago, the House enacted legislation requiring declaration of beneficial ownership of, of shares when you're registering a company. Since the passage of that legislation, I've had the opportunity to register companies, and I can tell you, it has not been easy to understand the procedures and how the procedures should apply. I don't know whether the Attorney General might not want to reconsider the approach dealing with the beneficial share ownership. In other words, maintain it by all means, Keep it because we, we have to satisfy the requirements of the OECD. But one of the questions that will arise is really whether the declaration should be a pre-incorporation one or a post-incorporation of a company. I mean, if you're registering a company with a sole, with a sole one director, then almost immediately the suggestion of beneficial shares um, is, is at first glance rather remote. And maybe the problem could be resolved if there's a general provision um, to introduce a basic format in dealing with this issue. So I think that these provisions are necessary, they're helpful. I don't see many members of the bar objecting 
for example, to the timelines to appoint secretaries and the like. I think everybody understands that, the necessity of that. But I believe the actual application of some of these provisions will be weighty, will be confusing, will be difficult, and I strongly suggest that we have a different approach because what this will eventually lead to is a serious slowdown of the incorporation of companies in the country. I think we need a little rethink, and perhaps it might be a good thing to have some discussions with the bar. Maybe the discussions have been held. I don't know. It's quite possible. But certainly, from a practical point of view, I envisage challenges in Im implementing this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, just very briefly, um, <clears throat> I agree, and from time to time, we have to amend the, the Companies Act because things change, businesses change, and the way we do business changes. My problem, Mr. Speaker, adding to what the member for, for Vford South said, is whether that act will lead to um, businesses or small business people not forming companies because of the, the onerous provisions of this act. I know that we may not have reached that stage yet, but I know there are some times when you can have uh, a law or part of a law that, only, that stipulates the authorized share capital of a business. So possibly we could see businesses if an authorized share capital of X amount should have X, X amount of provisions and businesses without these provisions. So I think that that may lead to small businesses being affected. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the amendment of Section 4, I think it, is, it doesn't allow people to make a mistake and to survive and to live after. It almost condemns you to, it condemns you to to a, a position where, like, a mistake is a failed life. I'll give you an example. An employment record that suggests that a person carried out an act of impropriety in the handling of his or her employer's business. Now, that is, that, that's wrong, but supposing the person has paid for the offense, does that mean that they're doomed for life? They can't be a director in, in, in a company? If they've committed of, I mean, a lot of crime is committed and, and, and no one gets caught. But, so I think we should try to look at, I mean, the other one, committed an offense involving fraud or other dishonesty or violence. <coughs> Again, if the person has paid their debt to society, they should not be, they, it, it should not be a situation where you're doomed for life. So, my, so my, my problem, Mr. Speaker, is we should look either to put a ceiling on the authorized share capital of companies that have to deal with that amendment or companies that do not have to deal with that amendment <coughs> because they, they, they are onerous and they will surely stop small businesses from expanding to form companies. Uh, and that, that is my contribution, but I agree that sometimes we need, we, need, we need to adjust, we need to amend the Companies Act for changing times. But I think it's, it's a bit onerous, particularly for small business people who want to form companies. I thank you. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the advice from the two members is always very, very, very welcome. But in consultation, let me just say that um, these are very minor amendments, as the member from Beaufort South would have spoken out, considering the size 
of the overall act that we're dealing with. And, and I just want to say that the principles of the act have not really been affected. And the purpose of coming here today, Mr. Speaker, really is from a, a security perspective, a risk perspective, being able to strengthen um, the existing legislation. I want to um, refer members to the wording that is used. So when we look at um, 2A, it says that in determining whether a person is a fit and proper person to hold the position as a director of a company, the following must be considered. So it's not definitive in its purpose. Also, when we go to 2B, it says without limiting the generality of subsection 2A, and it admits it's general, consideration must be given to the, the, to the previous conduct and activities in business or financial matters of a person in question, and in particular to evidence that that person has. So the fact is, this is not saying that if in fact they meet any one of these things that must be considered, that they could be denied. But the fact is, is that I think that the NRA is basically saying that the, we have a responsibility and businesses have a responsibility to be acutely aware of what their overall responsibilities are. And so I think that some of the concerns that the members on the other side are bringing up are, are, are clear. But at the same time, I want to say that we believe that the amendments in no way condemn people to the kind of future that the member from Castries East was referring to. These are things to be able to assist and to, for consideration to be given um, in order to be able to move forward. Um, and it is, it is a, a clear requirement in our risk assessment that we do make these amendments and they be not as onerous. In fact, we've concluded um, that it is not going to, in, uh, in fact, delay the establishment of companies, but we actually believe that this clarity will assist in actually improving the level of efficiency. Thank you. Honorable members, the question is that a company's amendment bill be read a second time. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say I. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. no. I think the eyes of it. The eyes of it. An act to amend the Companies Act Cap 13.01. Now review the bill. Clause two. Interpretation. Clause two stands part of the bill. Clause three. Amendment of section four. Yes. Clause <coughs> amendment section four. Clause three. Um, D. Clause three. D. Do you, do you want to consider putting a time frame on there? whether the person has faced our general court over the last five years or so. Because if that, and <laughs> for some reason, think of it this, because supposing somebody is, has that, that problem, and it happened 10, 15 years ago. So you don't think, it, um, Miss, I don't know if the government want to consider just sticking a time period in that. I feel very strong about this. A time period, it, it, this, is, this is really onerous really onerous. For, so if a man um, can't pay a debt for the rest of his life, he can't be a director of the company? I mean, can you remember to consider? I, want, I mean, just... <laughs> but, 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 but you see, there is, and again, it puts so much pressure on, on the registrar. The registrar has too much of a wide scope to control people. You can't control, yeah? You can't let individuals have so much control on people's lives you, because all kind of things can come into can come into play 
That's not politics, that's people's lives. Put a pill in it. That's an extremely onerous, but his whole life is doomed. What? Is, is you all that think we are against St. Lucia? We're not against St. Lucia. You all think so. Uh, you think, no, but... <laughs> Speaker, I, I appreciate the concerns, but I'm being reassured that these are not absolutes. These are things that must be taken into consideration. And we must put them down because we have to raise the standard of what is taking place in our country. We have people who are entering into businesses that don't even know how to file their income tax returns. And that there is an obligation once you're going to have a registered company. These are guidelines, but they're not absolutes. So these are things to be taken into consideration. And it'll be the judgment of looking at the whole thing as to whether in fact that they can proceed. But from a risk perspective, they have to be taken into consideration. And they could no longer remain silent. So just again, Mr. Speaker, in, on page, page 7, D, an employment record that suggests that a person carried an act of impropriety in hands of his or her employer assets over a time period again on that. Just a time period. Because, you know, it, <laughs> just... But it's not absolute. But, it's Mr. Not Prime Minister, it's the law. And you cannot have discretion when it comes, anytime there is discretion, it comes to the law. It, a lot of other things come into, we're dealing with human beings. Because, you know, we, we, we can cause laws that we have we well intentioned. But the fact is, as soon as you have human beings involved in making judgment calls on people's future, if you're not specific, you can enter into all kinds of problems. That's, so all I'm saying is that out of the abundance of, of caution and to ensure that that is not used as a tool, just put a time period in it. That's all I'm suggesting. And what would you suggest the amendment be? For over the last five years or ten years, if you want. It, right now, it's objective. Over the last ten years, you stick a, a, a time on it. You see, because, you see, you're in power now. That thing can turn you. We, we change spaces. Mr. Prime Minister? Um, again, I've been given the assurances that this, these provisions are now becoming standard provisions across the board. Um, and again, these are intended to be guidelines. And the fact is, is that because of the AML issues and also country risk issues, there has to be substantial more clarity. And so even in terms of when you open up a bank account and there's going to be a required level of due diligence, all we're doing is providing guidelines that help in terms of improving the quality of um, the, uh, 
um, the, the risk assessment that must be done. And so again, these are not absolute, so including whether it's ten, past 10 years or not below 10 years, it's still going to be taken into consideration. It's not going to be used in, in its final, uh, final, so if a person has committed a crime, it doesn't mean it's going to prohibit them. It has to be, everything must be taken into consideration. So the time period that it's passed, whether in fact they served their time, um, whether they have now improved themselves, all those things will be taken into consideration. But what has to be done is to basically say that when we are approving, these are the things that must be con taken into consideration in terms of establishing a new standard moving forward. Just one question, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, maybe you could get the advice from the AG. If an, if an offense, somebody, someone has committed an offense and the offense is spent, and which, is, which ought to be removed from the person's record. What happens in that situation? Mr. Speaker, I know there's a provision to allow the, the Attorney General to speak. Would we, would we like to invoke it's that? It's for us to vote whether we'll allow the Attorney General to speak. I mean, everyone Honor seems... Honorable members, the question is that we should allow the Attorney General to address the committee. Fine. Aye. Aye. As it pertains to the issue of um, the expungement of, of record, the criminal record, um, it, is a legitimate, it is a legitimate question, and it does not prevent an incorporator from being one who had once found, um, found themselves on the wrong side of the law. Um, I want to reiterate what the Honorable Prime Minister said, that this is, these are measures which are put in place to ensure that St. Lucia has a, a destination, financial destination, understands that we cannot, um, we, we must rather ensure that when persons undertake to set up accounts in the banks and what have you, there is a, there are synergies between the law. So what is, what obtains in the Companies Act, the amendments that is being proposed is, new to, is not new to our, our, our laws. It, it exists currently under the Banking Act. There's a certain level of due diligence which must be done before someone is able to set up an, an account. What is proposed here, or, or what, ex what is presented in the bill, are guidelines, for want of a better word. These are considerations that the, the incorporator must consider when pre presenting the registrar, the registrar of, of companies with the notice of directors. So give consideration to persons who ideally have those qualities or at least someone in there who could propose or, or, or do some level of due diligence within the entity. You have to file annual returns and, and everything else that comes with setting up a company. And um, for, as I said, the, the St. Lucia is currently undertaking the national risk assess assessment and we have no choice but to, to comply with these, um, these um, um, recommendations. And it's, this is a, across the, this, the space, the, the, the ECCB, um, Caribbean Financial Action Task Force recommendations for our, our region. It's, it's, it's be throughout the region. So each destination, each jurisdiction, they will come in and they do what they call a national risk assessment and identify those areas where we need to strengthen the law. And that is, is one such example. In, in form, um, model legislation will suggest that it, it's, it's been applied um, in terms of the, exactly, the, exactly in, in, in terms of the form. What, what, we, what has been done is the national risk assessment has been undertaken. We ha we've been doing this for over almost two years, and they've identified these areas as, as, as areas which need to be reconsidered and, and tightened up. But under no circumstance will someone be prevented from incorporating. Sorry? 
Well, actually, they were on the, on the ground, and we're hoping that um, this, this um, parliament would consider the changes before they leave, they, they completed their task, which is on the 29th of this month. But, but I, I completely, sorry. Thanks a lot. What's the meaning of um, section 2BA? Committing an offense involving fraud or other dishonesty or violence. Um, how you define violence abroad? Is it how do you how do we distinguish violence? Somebody gives somebody a slap. Um, so the it is something to be considered because when you you come in to set up the account again, we tie it again the, under the banking laws. They will do their due diligence and they may well reject your company. And you, I'm certain persons are aware of of instances where um, they were having difficulty in, in setting up a bank, having incorporated and having done the, the, everything pertaining to incorporation. They now cannot move to take their business to the next step of setting up a business account, etc., etc., because they may well be the banks having done their due diligence would disqualify certain members because of the, 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 um, they having found themselves running a foul of the law at some point. It has to be declared, so we must ask the question. Yeah, correct. The, but under no circumstance will someone not be incorporated. But this is really guidelines upon which they, they should conduct their affairs. Yes, sir. For chain of stores. He, he's, been, he's been convicted. Oh, well. Very small country, and the member for Chief Cash is not yeah. right. Yeah. There is a businessman, there is, we, don't, we don't mention any names here, but there is a businessman here who has committed a lot of violence, mm -hmm. the maximum of the violence, and now he has. He has He's a, he has a lot of a chain of stores, etc. So what, how, how would he come in that now? Here's the thing. It is still going to boil down to some, some issues which are to be considered. If you want to proceed having those issues and then you end up not being able to set up an account or having all of these difficulties, it, it is a risk that each person who incorporate, each incorporator will have to, to, to suffer. But ultimately, this is about protecting the jurisdiction as a whole. And for those who, who will be assessing us, could see that these are, this is a positive step to, to, um, to bring a level of oversight in the business of incorporation because they've identified and um, actually highlighted areas where money laundering and terrorism financing um, can be vehicles by which these, these activities can be facilitated. I just want to say that you know, when you're a, a lawyer, when you're an accountant, and the training that's being done by the FRA in terms of, of, sorry, FSRA, and the due diligence that you're supposed to do in terms of asking questions, this is the same process. Now this same principle is now being applied across the board. In registering a company, there must be consideration given to a person's background. And these are simply guidelines of some of the things that you need to look into. It does not prohibit, but the fact is, is that you did ask the questions, you did make the inquiry, and that you know that when you're making this approval, that that's what the standard of the person is. Now, it may be that in doing this compliance background that some person's records may be such that they should not have a company, and that is a possibility. But the fact is that it, this is not intended to be the standard on everything. These are things that must be taken into consideration in the due diligence. And it's no longer allowing it to leave it just uh, questionable on everybody's part. This is making it very clear that in registering a company that these are the kinds of things that must be taken into consideration in order to be able to give final approval. Honorable Member, speak for could you take What's us through so? the process of registering a company under these regulations? Do you evidence all these requirements that you have there? Assuming a registrar 
receives an application for incorporation. How do you evidence all the criteria that is there? Take us through the steps. What, what is the registrar going to ask the, the attorney for a police record? Is the registrar going to ask whether this person has um, worked previously in, in, in a company and he's engaged in oppressive behavior? Take us through the various provisions and let us know how you think a registrar is going to handle it. Because look at what has happened with the new requirements for beneficial interests. What has happened is that everybody has been um, confused as to, well, nearly everybody. How do you evidence the issue of beneficial interest to the registrar? I mean, in one case, I had to call the registrar and ask for directions of precisely what is, what is expected. And this is happening at a point of incorporation, not even at a, a, a post-incorporation post period, when the company um, has been registered, and then, of course, you make the declarations accordingly. Now, we, you, you were not given a, a, a form had to be crafted. So I'm not saying you that you don't need um, to, to make some of the adjustments, but the question is whether these adjustments in the hands of a registrar could work. That is why I, I really <coughs> would have loved if I got a response to the question I asked whether the bar had been consulted and what is their response to these, to, to these amendments. Because the reality is that there's going to be a slowdown in, 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 in the formation of companies in the island. That's the reality. A lot of people are not going to want to form companies. A lot of people might decide, okay, let's go back and go to business names. That's what's going to happen. I think it's just a... Prime Minister. The suggestion is that we, we now refer the bill to a, a special committee or meeting of the bar or the AG in term, well, What is the suggestion? This is of national interest to us. With regard to the first question on um, this, this is this is incumbent on the incorporator. When you incorporate a company, you ought to, to consider, that's why that language is being used, before you populate the position of, of director, you should, as the incorporator, undertake to have persons who at least have these qualities become directors. This, it, is, this is what it's about. Okay. Eugene, you're thinking now that you're suggesting that the incorporator will file statutory declarations. Is that the the? the a, a statutory declaration would, would suffice. But in, in that case, but, but, but the, the statutory declaration, there is no need for this to be in the legislation because it is a, a form of evidence when you prepare your form. So and in fact, when you, when you incorporate, so you have the, 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 one of the forms involves this thing. So you will state that the directors are not the persons, it's not a person described in, in this act. There, there are ways to do it. So it's just about crafting it. Leader of the opposition. Yeah, AG. Um, I heard, so AG, are you saying that that has an international deadline? Correct. All right. Just as a one, this is a, something that may sound... I look, something I may sound strange. So supposing somebody steals a dash in at 18, they care from a company at 40. No, no, no. No, I just ask, no, 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 because that's a letter, that's a letter of the law. Eh? And that is, I mean, uh, some, that is not, it may sound ludicrous, but the fact is it can be implemented because committed an offense involving fraud or other dishonesty. Stealing a dash in at 18 is an offense. No, and you can get convicted for it. Just want to. I, I mean, it sounds. Uh, I think. I think. Well, I think. Prime I think Minister. that we're. If we. If I can, um, the speaker. 
it's at what point did this happens. So by putting these guidelines here, if I am now going to be, my name is going to be used as becoming a director, and I have done something that would be red flagged, understand that that may be red flagged and I may be questioned about it and therefore I'm going to have to provide an answer to it. So it's also really to help people who are going to be registered or going to be opening companies, understanding that they will be open to this level of scrutiny before they come in. And if in fact that they have issues, they can provide an explanation. Because there is always, a, it's not saying that if you have a record that you cannot become. But understand that if you have a record, you need, and you need to flag it, and you need to be able to identify it, and say so. What do you do in that kind of situation given the elaborate um, requirements? So, I, I mean, I, at least the legislation should say that the um, director, whoever, or the incorporator should, um, by affidavit, um, testify to this. This is, this is strange. At ultimately, if an incorporator does not dis make full disclosure to the, the incorporating attorney, then this consequence will be theirs only. And um, the, the statutory declaration can also include, as by way of just a, another paragraph, that they have explained this, this, um, provision. this provision, and it has been the, the, the incorporator has indicated that there's so compliance thereof. The legis this can be in, in the in the statutory declaration. That can be easily cured. I believe it can be easily cured. Clause three. Well, since we consider, you may very well just say it. Clause three stands part of the bill. Clause four. Substitution of section eighteen. Clause four stands part of the bill. Clause 5. Amendment of section 59. Clause 5 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 6. Amendment of section 69A. Clause 6 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 7. Amendment of section 77. Clause 7 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 8. Amendment of section 178. Clause 8 stands part of the bill. Clause 9. Amendment of section 327. Clause 9 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 10. Amendment of section 521. Clause 10 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 11. Amendment of section 523. Clause 11 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 1. Short title. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. Aye. Honorable members, the question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Honorable members, I beg to report that the company's amendment bill went through committee stage with no amendments. Honorable Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Speaker, I, I move uh, for the report of the committee to be adopted and that the bill be read a third time and passed. Honorable members, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the company's amendment bill be read a third time and passed. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes are red. The eyes are red. 
be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty by and with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia and by the authority of the same as follows. This act may be cited as the Company's Amendment Act 2019. Honorable Prime Minister. Speaker, I beg to move for the first reading of a bill shortly entitled Anti-Terrorism Amendment. Anti-Terrorism Amendment. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move for the suspension of Standing Order 48-2 to allow the bill to go through its remaining stages at this sitting. Honorable Members, the question is that Standing Order Number 48 be suspended in order to allow the Honorable Minister to proceed with the remaining stages of the bill at this sitting. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, see I? As many as of a contrary opinion, see no? I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Leave is granted. Proceed on. Speaker, I beg to move for the second reading of a bill shortly entitled the Anti-Terrorism Amendment. The rise of terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, Hezbollah, and ISIL, Daesh, and the indigenous ways in which they extract financial and economic support from the global community is a cause for concern for the United Nations Security Council and Financial Action Task Force, FATF. The United Nations Security Council, in meeting its objective for ensuring international peace and security, made resolutions that are aimed in part at combating threats to the integrity of the international financial system. These resolutions from form the core of the FATF's standards geared towards combating terrorist financing and other related threats to the integrity of the international financial system. St. Lucia has made inroads in combating terrorism through the enactment of the Anti-Terrorism Act, CAP 316. However, FATF in the third mutual evaluation report for St. Lucia found the following deficiencies. A, a lack of proper mechanisms for St. Lucia to identify and propose to the United Nations Security Council the names of persons who may fit the United Nations Security Council criteria for being listed as a terrorist. B, a lack of mechanisms for St. Lucia to identify and designate a person as a terrorist at the national level. C, inadequacy in providing for the implementation of targeted financial and economic sanctions, which involves the freezing of property of persons listed as terrorists by the United Nations Security Council. And four, the bill therefore seeks to amend the act to cure these deficiencies. It sets out a mechanism for the St. Lucia to identify and propose to the United Nations Security Council the names of persons who fit the United Nations Security Council criteria for being listed as terrorists and to identify and designate persons as terrorists at the national level. The bill contains new provisions that empowers the Attorney General to propose the names of the potential terrorists to the United Nations Security Council in order to in order to list those persons as terrorists. Provisions, will be, provisions for delisting are also included under the bill. The bill seeks to amend the act to make it an offense for a person to provide economic resources to another person for the commissioning of a terrorist act. Further, the bill seeks to amend the act to include new provisions which set out the procedure for applying targeted financial sanctions these procedures require the Attorney General to make an urgent application to the court for a freezing order to freeze property that is wholly or jointly owned or controlled directly or indirectly by terrorists. As in the case of the freezing of the assets of the proliferations, proliferators of, of proliferators of weapons of mass destruction, financial institutions and persons engaged in other business activities, such as attorneys at law, accountants and real estate dealers are required to apply a freezing order, especially in urgent cases. However, the bill provides safeguards that allow a bona fide third party to apply for the court to review or set aside the freezing order. Honorable members, the question is that the Anti-Terrorism Amendment Bill be read a second time. 
I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion say I. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. An act to amend the Anti Terrorism Act, Tap 3.16. Honourable members, we shall now review the legislation, the proposed bill. Clause 2. Interpretation. Clause 2 stands part of the bill. Clause 3. Amendment of Section 2. Clause 3 stands part of the bill. Clause 4. Amendment of Section 3. Clause 4 stands part of the bill. Clause 5. Insertion of new sections 3A and 3B. Clause 5 stands part of the bill. Clause 6. Substitution of Section 6. Clause 6 stands part of the bill. Clause 7. Insertion of new Section 6A. Clause 7 stands part of the bill. Clause 8. Amendment of Section 7. Clause 8 stands part of the bill. Clause 9. Amendment of Section 19. Clause 9 stands part of the bill. Clause 10. Insertion of new sections 22A, 22B, 22C, 22D, 22E, 22F, 22G, and 22H. Clause 10, clause 10 stands part of the bill. Clause 11. Amendment of section 32. Clause 11 stands part of the bill. Clause 1. Short title. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. Honourable members, the question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable members, I beg, the, I beg to report that the bill, that the committee, that the bill went for committee with no amendments. Honorable Prime Minister, move that the report of the committee be adopted and the bill read a third time and passed. Honorable members, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the anti-terrorism amendment bill be read a third time and passed. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same as follows. This act may be cited at, as the Anti Terrorism Amendment Act 2019. Honorable Prime Minister. Speaker, I beg to move for the first reading of a bill shortly entitled United Nations Sanctions Counter Proliferation Financing. United Nations Counter Proliferation Financing. Honorable Prime Minister. Speaker, I beg for the move for the suspension of Standing Order 482 to allow the bill to go through its remaining stages at this sitting. Honorable Members, the question is that Standing Order Number 482 be suspended in order to allow the Honorable Prime Minister to proceed with the remaining stages of the bill at this sitting. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. As many as of contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leave is granted. Proceed. The Speaker, I beg to present for a second reading a bill shortly entitled United Nations Sanctions Counter Proliferation Financing. The financing of the prolification of weapons of mass destruction like the financing of terrorism is of grave concern to the United Nations Security Council and the Financial Action Task Force, FATF. The United Nations Security Council, in meeting its objectives for ensuring international peace and security, made resolutions which form the core of the FATF standards geared towards countering 
the financing of the proliferation of mass destruction. The resolutions are country-specific, currently against the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and Iran, requiring St. Lucia to enact counter-proliferation financing legislation that provides for targeted financial and economic sanctions to be imposed on any country in respect of which the resolution is made. Similar to the freezing of assets under the proposed anti-terrorism regime, St. Lucia is obligated, among other things, to cause the freezing of property of persons who are designated or listed pursuant to the resolution as being engaged in the financing of the prolification of weapons of mass destruction. As part of this, of this sanctions regime, the bill establishes a national coordinating committee or counter prolification financing to oversee the implementation of financial and economic sanctions and generally to administer the bill. The committee consists of seven members appointed by cabinet being representative from the Department of External Affairs, the Ministry of Justice, Attorney General Chambers, Customs and Excise Department, Financial Intelligence Authority, Financial Services Regulatory Authority, and the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. The committee will collaborate with other stakeholders involved in counter-prolification financing initiatives with a view to developing counter-prolification financing policies and procedures to combat the financing of the prolification of weapons of mass destruction. The mechanism by which targeted financial sanctions will be applied is provided under the bill. This may require the Attorney General to make an urgent application to the court for a freezing order to freeze property that is wholly or jointly owned or controlled, directly or indirectly, by a listed entity or that is derived or generated from a property or others assets owned or controlled directly or indirectly by a listed entity. It is also provided under the bill that financial institutions and persons engaged in other businesses, business activities, such as attorneys at law, accountants and real estate dealers are required to give effect to a freezing order, especially in urgent cases. It must be noted, however, that there are safeguards under the bill which allow a listed entity and a bona fide third party to apply to the court for review of a freezing order. Additionally, the bill contains provisions prohibiting persons, except with the prior approval of the United Nations Security Council and a permit granted under the bill from exporting and selling missile-related or nuclear-related items to or from engaging in financial tra transactions with a country that is subject to the targeted financial and economic sanctions. Importantly, the bill empowers the Minister of National Security to amend the schedules of the bill and to make regulations. This power will enable the speedy delisting of non-application of the bill to countries that are no longer subject to the targeted financial and economic sanctions. Honourable Members, the question is that the United Nations sanctions counter-proliferation financing bill be read a second time. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. An act to facilitate the implementation of sanctions imposed by the United Nations Security Council resolutions relating to combating threats to the integrity of the international financial system and for related matters. Honorable members, because of the volume of the bill, we shall proceed by way of parts. So we shall first start with clause two. Interpretation. Clause two stands part of the bill. Aye. Part one, clauses three to 14. Administration. Part one, clauses three to 14 stands part of the bill. Aye. Part two, clauses Part 2, Clause 14. Proposals to United Nations Security Council Committee. Part 2, Clauses 14 stands part of the bill. Aye. Part 3, Clauses 15 to 23. Freezing order. Part 3, Clauses 15 to 23 stands part of the bill. Aye. 
part 4, clauses 24 to 26. Prohibited dealings with listed entity. Plus part 4, clauses 24 to 26, that is part of the bill. Aye. Part 5, clauses 27 to 33. Prohibited activities with prescribed country. Part 5, clauses 27 to 43, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part 6, clauses 44 to 48. Enforcement. Part 6, clauses 44 to 48, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part 7, clause 49. Jurisdiction of the court. Part 7, clause 49, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part 8, clauses 40 to 42. Miscellaneous. Part 8, clauses 40 to 42, stands part of the bill. Aye. Schedule 1. Section 2. Schedule 1, stands part of the bill. Aye. Schedule 2. Section 2. Schedule 2, stands part of the bill. Aye. Schedule 3. Section 27, 2. Schedule 3, stands part of the bill. Aye. Schedule 4. Section 27, 2. Schedule 4, stands part of the bill. Clause 1. Short title. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. Honourable members, the question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable members, I beg to report that the United Nations sanctions counter proliferation financing bill went through committee stage with no amendments. Honorable Prime Minister. Speaker, I move the report of the committee be adopted and the bill be read a third time and passed. Honorable members, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the United Nations sanctions counter proliferation financing bill be read a third time and passed. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the theme, as follows. This act may be cited as the United Nations Sanctions Counter-Proliferation Financing Act 2019. Honorable Prime Minister. Speaker, I move that the House stand adjourned, Senator. Honorable members, the question is that the House do stand adjourned, Senator. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Sit in the journal. All right. Well, we've just had the adjournment uh, of the House of Assembly, sign a die, sitting today, Tuesday, September 17th, 20. 19 and quite a day it has been quite an interesting order paper not really that long but certainly the substantive matters up for discussion today brought it to the completion this evening just at about a quarter past eight in the evening when we had the usual announcement by the speaker statement by ministers and number of papers were also laid and then we got into the really substantive issues today questions for all reply by the Honorable Member for Cass Street South, given that the estimates of expenditure for 2017, 2018, 2018, 2019, and 2019, 2020 show that government had collected revenue from the Citizenship by Investment Program, CIP, that the Minister provides an account of how the revenue has been expended, stating the recipients of projects and the purposes for such expenditure. And the main part of today's debate, actually, the motion by the Honorable Member for Cass Street South, that it be resolved that Parliament by negative resolution approve that Regulation 2 and Regulation 10 provided by Statutory Instrument 2015, number 89, be hereby reinstated and that really took up most of the day's proceedings as far as debate is concerned with members' 
across the floor um, giving their contributions at times he did at times really bringing out the best of the contribution from the, the speaker today and really extended today's sitting and they're sitting ending with a number of bills going through all the stages the standing order 42 suspended to allow them to go through all the stages and the company's amendment certainly brought in a lot of discussion at committee stage with the attorney general stephen julian having been brought in at some point to clarify some matters that members wanted to get further information on as to how the company's amendment would have actually allowed access for St. Lucian businesses and for the incorporation of a number of companies. We also had the other two bills going through all the stages this evening, the anti-terrorism amendment and the United National Sanctions counter-proliferation financing. So that really brought the end to proceeding here today from the House of Parliament, this sitting of the House of Assembly. And we are happy that you're able to join us here for our live coverage on the National Television Network, providing you with all the debate on today. So on behalf of the entire team and all our crew that brought you the coverage throughout the day, I'm Ryan O'Brien saying goodbye from the House of Parliament.